Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, on behalf of the iQuilt Partnership, um, I want to thank you for spending a night tonight with us um, and for our wonderful um, Creative Cities conversation that we've put together for you this evening. Um, we just have a couple brief um, welcomes before we start our program this evening, and I think you're going to truly enjoy Leslie. I had the opportunity to spend the afternoon with her and Doug today. Um, and it truly opens your eyes seeing um, everything around Hartford through someone else's eyes. So um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and I'd like to introduce Tom Deller on behalf of the mayor to come down and, and just say a welcome for us today. Good evening. And on behalf of uh, Mayor Pedro Cigar, welcome to this discussion on uh, creative communities. I think that, you know, uh, most people know that I've only been here two and a half years, closing in on three. Not that anyone's counting, but it seems like forever. Um, <clears throat> you know, I came to Hartford and, and realized that this city has got an unbelievable potential that we've, uh, we haven't realized. And I think that we're at a point where, through the iQuilt and the things that are coming through iQuilt, that we're starting to really recognize the potential of this city and the excitement that this city has. And I think that we need to work together and understanding creative places, creative communities, and how to make those things happen is very important to us. Uh, we change, we work day to day to try to make these things happen. It's difficult, but we need to work together. We need to have that sense of place and we need to recognize the quality that's here. And thank you for being here. Enjoy this discussion, learn from this discussion. And when you hear something that you think is very important and creative that you think we're missing, let us know. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. We're also very honored to have Kip Berksham, the Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Economic and Community Development here tonight. And uh, Kip, I'm hoping you can come up and give us some words of wisdom. So whenever I'm at a gathering of folks that has anything to do with placemaking, I love to quote that famous American philosopher Linda Ronstadt, <laughs> who talked about um, a place is where our souls inhabit the soil. And it's the notion that as we make places, so do places make us. And just reflect on your own about the place that made you or the places that made you um, are you lucky enough to live or work in a place that's making you now where your soul inhabits the soil? I hope you do. Um, and we're hoping to make Hartford a place where a lot of souls inhabit the soil. Um, it already is, but more. Uh, we were an early funder of iQuilt. I think it's a terrific concept. Um, and are encouraged by these conversations uh, about creative cities. And I have a, a personal interest in this one. Uh, I was telling Leslie that uh, before she started her work and the one and only time I was at Governor's Island, I actually slept in the barracks there, which was part of a Civil War reenacting unit of the Irish Brigade. And we um, went from Governor's Island to Manhattan boarded the train on mass, bayonets fixed. It was a bizarre moment, but um, <laughs> I'm eager to see what uh, Governor's Island has become. So I look forward it, to the event along with you. Thanks. Thanks. And last but not least, before I um, introduce Doug, I would like to thank, uh, TheaterWorks is such one of our lovely community gems that we have here in this, or cultural gems that we have here in the city of Hartford. Um, and I want to thank Freddie and Dina for having us here this evening. Um, it's such a perfect place to have a nice, cozy, intimate conversation like we're going to have this evening. So Freddie, thank you very much. And if you want to say how everyone should come to your next show and when it's going to happen. Um, <laughs> but I, I see faces I'm familiar with as well. And TheaterWorks, if you don't know, is a uh, almost 30-year-old professional theater company. We've been in this building for most of that time. And in light of tonight's discussion, I, I guess what's probably most interesting is that we are also property owners, and a lot of people don't know that about us. So we are literally standing on our patch of the quilt, so to speak. 
right now. As well, the other thing about TheatreWorks that's very interesting is that we're, as a landlord, we have tenants, tenants who are arts organizations that <coughs> many of you are familiar with that um, are able to stay downtown, have a downtown presence, because we can work out you know, moderate uh, rent levels and, and, and support that. So we are also, I guess, placemaking in action. Um, and we're very proud of that. We're thrilled that you're here tonight. And we'll hope to see you all again soon. So without further ado, because I am not into introductions, I want to get right down into the program and let's get going. So without further introduction, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say, Doug, take it over, uh, take it away, and uh, let's start the show and let's start the community conversation that we're going to have this evening. So thank you very much. Hi, everybody. I'm Doug Sussman. Um, and, uh, had the good fortune to be involved in the iQuilt project uh, from the earliest days with uh, Ronald Reynolds at the, at the Bushnell. Uh, but tonight, um, it's just a, a thrill to be here because a year ago, I had the privilege of being involved in the first City Lab conference organized by Mayor Bloomberg in New York. And um, we were in Lower Manhattan, but there were a bunch of tours, and you could sign up for one or the other. And I thought, Governor's Island, that sounds interesting. I like islands, and I'll be on a boat. So let me go out and see what's going on there. And 40 lucky souls out of a conference of several hundred people also signed up. And we took the ferry across um, and uh, were greeted on the other end by an extraordinarily articulate and energetic woman who led us around the island, knew everything about it, uh, and just conveyed her enthusiasm for what she was doing to the entire group. And of course, that was... Leslie Koch herself, the president of the Trust for Governor's Island. And since then, I've just thought, um, wouldn't it be great to get her to Hartford? Uh, a note for Hartford lovers, she knew about Hartford. She even knew about the iQuilt plan and thought it was pretty good. So that was, that endeared, of course, all of us to her and, uh, <laughs> e e e or uh, her to us even more. And uh, when we asked, we didn't know. She's very busy. She lectures all over the country and, and in other parts of the world about how you do this stuff, because they've done it so well on Governor's Island. We thought, please be available on the, one of the nights we can do it, and she said yes. So um, a bit of background, just so you know how lucky we are to have her here tonight. Um, as, the, as the president of Governor's Island, it's a 172-acre it's a island and former military base. You're going to hear about it. She's responsible for the planning, redevelopment, and ongoing operation of the 150 acres that belong to the trust. Um, she's known as an innovator uh, and a creative executive, but she balances, puts equal focus on both vision and execution, which should resonate for those of you who are working on, on iQuilt. And under her leadership since 2006, the island, Governor's Island, has become a huge resource and destination for New York. Um, she developed the strategy to create a new park and vibrant public places to expand public access and the early signature uses of the park to invest in its infrastructure and stabilize the, the plan for mixed-use public and private development. And she'll tell you all about that. But the island has received, she may not tell you how much national attention it's received for its innovative park and public space design, and it's attracted hundreds of thousands of visitors, probably getting close to a million. I don't know what the numbers are now. Uh, on an island that no one had ever been to before unless you were in the military or, like Kip, were enacting being in the military. Uh, and that's a great story. Um, prior to the trust, she was the CEO of the Fund for Public Schools. So it was a nonprofit organization affiliated with the New York Public City Department of Education where she developed initiatives to increase public participation, that's important, and private sector support, that's also important, for public education. And she secured nearly $160 million for that system. So she's obviously a doer, enormously savvy in sort of working both the public and private side of things to get things done. Um, she's a native New Yorker. Um, she received uh, her BA, summa cum laude, from Yale and went on to the Yale School of Management. Um, she lives in Brooklyn, but uh, gave up a cozy evening at home in Brooklyn to spend the evening here with us in Hartford, and we're so grateful. Leslie. Thank you so much. It's great to be here, and I'm going to do a little research on that reenactment. And I would like photos, Kip, because we'll put those in our archive. Um, 
I'm going to talk a little bit about Governor's Island, and I'm going to start with some facts. Um, how many people have ever been to Governor's Island? Oh, a few. Okay, well. Um, it is a 172-acre island in the middle of New York Harbor. It's about 800 yards from Manhattan. You can only get there by boat. It is a former military base that was closed to the public for its entire history. Um, and it first opened to the public uh, in 2005. So as Doug mentioned, I grew up in New York, and I had never heard of Governor's Island until I was offered the job of running it. That is a true story. Um, <laughs> Here is a picture of the island uh, with our new park, so you can sort of see the proximity uh, to Lower Manhattan and Brooklyn um, off to the right. Um, in 2003, 150 acres of the island were transferred to New York, uh, now managed by the trust, so that's the red and the green. Uh, the blue part uh, is actually a national monument owned and managed by the National Park Service, the federal government. And uh, just for fun, when it was transferred, uh, the federal government prohibited residential housing or gambling, um, which would be the only likely ways that you could make money. They also forgot to provide any subsidy. Um, and a few other things that I won't go into uh, to describe sort of the challenges of this place, because really the only thing you need to remember is it's shaped like an ice cream cone. Um, <laughs> And uh, every small child who visits uh, recognizes that with our map. And the ice cream part of the island, the northern half, is a National Historic District, which includes uh, those forts, the National Monument, but it also includes uh, 1.4 million square feet of vacant buildings um, that are landmarked, that we are legally <coughs> responsible for, um, as well as every uh, blade of grass and every brick uh, is also landmarked. Um, that's the ice cream. The cone, uh, when I got there back in 2006, was flat as a pancake, uh, looked just like that, uh, really scenic, filled with derelict buildings, uh, was actually landfill that had been added in 1905, uh, totally close to the public. It had potential, as you, we all know from real estate ads, because it had these great views of the Statue of Liberty. And by the way, um, we had to build a new park, but I've, I mentioned already that there was no money for that. Um, so in 2006, when I started, the only question I asked, actually, my husband was, am I insane for taking this job? But really the question that anyone who paid attention to Governor's Island, which was not a lot of people, said, what will this place be? In other words, what is the master plan? Or if people were honest, you know, God, is anything ever going to happen on this place? And so the questions that we asked instead were, what does New York City not have? And I can say this because I'm in Hartford. Um, I'm sure you're aware that New York City is the most parochial place on the planet. So asking that question in New York City, I'm sure in Hartford you might ask, what do we not have in Hartford? Um, people in New York City never ask that question. Um, but we also said, would it make sense on an island, right? There's lots of things New York City doesn't have, probably doesn't make sense on an island. What should happen first seemed like a better question than what's the grand vision. I was asked today by a reporter on the way up what my idea for a utopian project was, and I just said, oh, I don't want to even talk about utopias. I'm much more pragmatic. But really, we had to ask the question, why would anyone come here on a Sunday afternoon? And I think that's kind of a similar question as you're thinking about Hartford, which is filled with people here during the week. People are starting to move downtown. Um, but really, um, people can do lots of fancy plans, but really you just have to say like, how can I convince my next door neighbor to come to this place on a Sunday afternoon? And that's really how we started. So our answers are very simple. Uh, one is open house, looks like an open house sign, and it is. The other is a knish, um, and the third is hammocks. So these are also, of course, metaphors, so I'm not suggesting that we all eat hammocks, eat hammocks, eat knishes on hammocks. But um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our strategy um, through the prism of these uh, three ideas. And then when I'm done, I have a little video. Um, where you'll see more of me talking, but you'll get to sort of see the island in action. And then Doug's going to ask me hard questions, which he hasn't told me in advance. Um, so I want to talk about open house. This is obviously an open house sign. So New York was, is, considers itself the cultural capital of the world. And so we asked that question, right? You have the Guggenheim, the Met, all these places. What is still missing from New York? And what was missing was a flexible, free space for public programming. Like it or not, municipal parks do not view this as their job um, in New York City or in other cities. Um, and in fact, this is not what cultural institutions do. So we had the attitude, not if you built it, right? Because we already had all these vacant buildings, but if you just encourage it. Um, they will come. And our formula was very simple. We call it the spaghetti strategy. Uh, spaghetti meaning uh, we were completely open to ideas, and that meant we would throw spaghetti against the wall. And if you wanted to throw spaghetti, we were very happy to provide you a wall and hope that it stick, stuck. 
Um, friendly bureaucracy, that is not an oxymoron. I work for the government, um, but we are super friendly and want to help you when you come to us with an idea, make that happen. But we don't fund anything. We don't fund any of the programming that takes place on Governor's Island, and we don't curate or select anything. So our, our formula is very different from that of traditional cultural institutions um, and of other public spaces. So that idea emerged into a program that we call Open House GI. We offer up 150,000 square feet of indoor space in our former officers' houses. You can see one of them on the lower right, and 20 acres of outdoor space free of charge to any organization that wants to create programming that's free and open to the public during our season. We're open uh, from the end of May to the end of September. It's about two dozen houses. It's completely transparent process online. Everyone gets the same information. Um, and as I mentioned, it's free for you as a visitor and it's free for the organization. With this island as a magnet, as we get um, more people um, going out to the media um, and talking about these incredible projects, and now in a world where really anyone can create graphic design and promote projects uh, online using uh, you know, Twitter, Facebook, whatever it is, we have now created this sort of amazing, it amazes me, citywide platform to attract audiences. And so on a typical day, if you had been in Governor's Island, not back when Kip long ago was there, um, I'm sorry I didn't pick a reenactment day, um, this is what you could have done. In addition to riding a bicycle, taking a nap in a hammock, e eating lunch, doing all the kinds of things you do in a park, we had about a dozen indoor exhibits. Um, our artist studio program in the upper, it's called LMCC, uh, dance performances, uh, mini golf designed by artists, uh, compost we consider culture, um, a Curious Invasion, I believe, is a dance performance, uh, free music, um, and if I, I could make a map for every weekend day of the season, and it would be slightly different, because every weekend, different kinds of festivals and performances come to the island uh, through groups that present them, uh, and we don't get involved in any of the artistic choices. When I say DIY graphics, so these are just posters, we ask each organization to create a poster the same size. So this gives you a feeling of what it's like to be there. These are all different voices, many of them created by groups we've never heard of. Uh, we consider the Volkswagen traffic jam a form of culture. Um, that is this year's 68 VW Bugs, an all-time record parked on Governor's Island. Uh, not next to Punk Island, just the poster is next to it. Um, this past year, we had about 60, more than 60 organizations creating programming on Governor's Island, um, uh, which is a quite a big increase from previous years. And they're doing all kinds of things. There's theater, there's dance, there's indoor exhibits. Special events range from street food uh, competitions to competitive bocce to you name it. Open rehearsals where you, as a New Yorker, can talk to an artist, watch a work in process, and all kinds of workshops from composting to how to grow basil to uh, how to make a kite. Um, this program includes what I call the nascent uh, and the established. So about half the groups have no other home. Um, this gives you a sense. Um, I don't think you can probably tell which is the established organization and which is the one-person shop. Uh, on the right is the Brooklyn Public Library doing a pop-up library with free um, reading. And on the left is a choreographer who created this project herself. It's called Framing New York. It speaks for itself. Um, and uh, the range uh, is enormous. Uh, and uh, you see on the right here, uh, this is an exhibit created, uh, an exhibition every year created by artists, for artists, no professional curators. It's made out of uh, plastic fasteners. It was uh, landed on the front page of the New York Times art section. Uh, and this is a guy who's obsessed with math, because of course math for us is part of culture. We have that broad definition of culture. Um, and these are some comments from some of the artists who have the opportunity to work on the island. Uh, this is a, actually a performance in a camper, um, a group called Third Rail uh, that talks about, uh, this is Janine, one of the artistic directors, talking about her opportunity to be in conversation with the public. Uh, this is another artist who created, um, believe it or not, in one of our forts. Uh, you had an intimate uh, encounter with a video image of the artist Marina Abramovich. You were wearing 3D glasses. Um, and for Matthew, who had done this piece before, it was the first time he'd ever had the general public. So his favorite comment was a 12-year-old who wrote, who came with his little brother, said, so not for 7 to 10-year-olds, but so awesome. <laughs> um, and trust me, that was not the same commentary that Matthew got when he did this at Art Basel in Miami the previous year. Um, and these are some images of just the kinds of things, photography, jazz lawn party, carousel festival, curious invasion. 
uh, Figment African Film Festival. And with this open platform and open house, thousands and thousands of people are coming. So the summer before I got to Governor's Island, which was 2005, we had 8,000 people come the entire season. On a typical weekend day last summer, we had 9,000 people a day. Um, so people love this uh, experience of this open platform and this feeling of open house. Um, and we have really become this lively and loved destination, this abandoned military base where there were just a few reenactors, um, and that was it, um, with this incredible ferment of culture broadly defined uh, and New Yorkers getting to experience and participate in that. So we have lots and lots of visitors. Once they're here on the island, how do we truly make them feel welcome? So I'm gonna talk about knishes. Um, does everyone know what a knish is? I did this presentation, there were some Australians. I had to, okay, so knish is a small sort of hockey puck-like item um, that is a tradition, historically a Jewish food. Um, and everyone talks about engagement. Uh, in the world that I'm in, public policy, planning, everyone talks about citizen engagement, artistic engagement. On Governor's Island, if you work on our team, the only time you can use the word engagement is if you have a new ring on your finger. <laughs> and the reason is because ordinary people never, ever use that word. Um, and we, when we talk about serving the public and creating a welcoming place for the public, only want to use language that you use when you describe your experience of a place. So if you're going to invite and welcome people, you really have to mean it. So we took a page from Disney. I actually, for the first time in my life, went to Disney World a few weeks ago. I was the youngest person in my family party. It's a long story. But... <laughs> You know, these guys have it down, right? They really, right? You can go to anyone, ask where the bathroom is. You know, you can read all that stuff, and you really feel welcome when you're at Disney. And I felt it, and we have the same mantra when we're on Governor's Island. So why do we consider the Kanish our welcome mat? Because it's really a metaphor for what it means when you actually listen and truly act to make people feel welcome. So Governor's Island is a place for New Yorkers. More than 75% of our visitors live in the five boroughs. Uh, that's very important to us. We do a ton of outreach in all kinds of communities to make sure that everybody feels welcome. And food is actually elemental to our strategy. Um, and it's elemental because obviously you're on an island and you have to eat. You're there for three or four hours. Um, but really, if you go back to Maslow's Pyramid, right, food is the most important thing. We can all talk about culture, right? This is right, seventh grade, whenever we first saw this. And so we believe in this. Um, and in fact, we just restored potable water to the island. So we actually um, were welcoming people long before we were satisfying the lower level of this. <laughs> but food is welcoming because it's comforting and it's familiar. Um, food needs to vary in taste points. So some people are vegan. Some people want to eat pulled pork. Price points, we have organic ice cream and we have Mr. Softy, and we're very proud of that. It has to be tasty, and tasty varies to all kinds of people, and it has to be recognizable. So we're very proud that we have lots of what are called dirty water hot dogs. So if you want to have an organic you know, $10 sandwich, you can do that. So that's all great, and this is our pictures of our visitors, but there were some of our visitors who actually weren't able to fully participate in our experience because we have many visitors who come from the religious Jewish communities, Hasidic families, other uh, Orthodox families. We didn't have kosher food, and this really bothered me um, because I felt like one of the wonderful things about this truly democratic shared place was that everybody was doing all the same things, playing mini golf, talking to artists, riding bikes, but there was a group and a big group of people who couldn't share in that experience. So I got a uh, knish vending machine. <laughs> now what makes this kosher? It is not just that the knish is in self kosher. The machine does not work on Shabbat. <laughs> okay. um, that was necessary, but not sufficient. So we had that for three years, and I just, this is not adequate. So I actually went out into Borough Park, which is a community in New York where a lot of uh, the Orthodox live, and worked with a council member who actually this is not our community, this is not our district. He, but he knew that many of his constituents like Governor's Island, so he issued a press release calling for kosher vendors. So the result is schnitzies. And let me tell you, schnitzies is what is called from kosher. And uh, people recognize that, it's tasty for all of us, but our Orthodox uh, visitors see that and they feel totally welcome that we have gone the extra mile to make sure that they are having the same experience. And this is the only public space in New York um, that has kosher food. So my advice always is find your knish. Everybody has something that is the symbol and the action that will make your space, um, your city, welcoming and for everyone and, and everything that you do. 
So I mentioned hammocks at the beginning. So it's important for us to be open and welcoming, both to our visitors and also this open platform. But one of the things we've also done in creating this new place is really kind of experiment and improvise and try out things um, that we had no idea if they would work. So the symbol of that for us is hammocks. So we, had, we listen to people a lot. And uh, we have post-it notes. Thousands of people every season tell us what they like. Um, adults actually, it turns out, are quite creative. Um, we put out rubber stamps for children. Believe it or not, grown-ups make little haikus. Um, so they gave us lots of feedback. And then what we would do is we would actually take all the words from these post-it notes and put them in a word cloud so we could tell you like we actually listened. So it was pretty easy ice cream, we got ice cream the next year. This is one of our first word clouds. But this was actually was statistically significant. This was the year we introduced biking. And the bike word was much bigger than the number of people biking. So we knew we were onto something. And we then designed a park built around biking. Um, so we take this very seriously. But we do like the juxtaposition of free and love um, uh, in this. We also did a lot of watching people, not in a kind of creepy way, um, but just, you know, what, where did you go? Where did you look for shade? And then how did that affect our design as we were working on the new park, which is now the centerpiece of the experience? But most importantly, we experiment and improvise. We take risks. Um, we'll just try things, and if they don't work, we'll, we'll try them again. So literally eight years ago, um, somebody came to the island who happens to be, her name is Myra Kalman, so you may recognize uh, her illustrations, and she just said to me, this should be the island of a thousand hammocks. And I just thought, that's such a great idea. Like, and you know, this was a dark, it was a November day, and I, that idea just kind of stuck with us. So we went shopping a few years later. We went online, we bought the same hammocks you probably have in your backyard. We bought 20 of them. And then we actually tore down some buildings in the southern tip of the island, and we put out these hammocks. And lo and behold, you know, you'd say, duh, people like hammocks. Well, hammocks in a public space in a city are not the same thing as hammocks in your backyard. First of all, many children who grew up in New York City have never seen a hammock before. And I'm sorry to say that there was a gender divide. Girls would sort of touch it, see if it would bite them. And boys would dive bomb and see if they could flip it over. Um, there were no injuries. Um, and then people would use it. They would put four people in a hammock. They would have a birthday party. They would have lunch. Um, it just became the most sort of wonderful way to experience the island. So as we were working on the park, we took the area that was intended by the landscape architect to be the sort of grove of trees, and we put hammocks, and we, nicked, and we called it Hammock Grove. Um, and lo and behold, this is Governor's Island last summer uh, with Hammock Grove. Uh, so we now have 50 hammocks. And we now have people call us uh, during the week saying, can, you, can I reserve a hammock, please? <laughs> um, and so this uh, just gives you a sense, and we'll, I'll turn to the video in a second, of just what the park looks like and kind of some of the feedback we've gotten um, as we've opened this new park um, and had this experience. Uh, the hammocks are just a little bit to the south of that. Um, but this gives you that sense of the diverse array of things that people do here. They experience art. They play sports. Um, they look at the Statue of Liberty. They tell us it feels like Shangri-La. Um, they try all kinds of things. And uh, they really uh, enjoy the feeling of openness, the opportunity to eat knishes, and the opportunity to nap in a hammock. So we like to think of this as the island created by and for New Yorkers. And yes, that is a dig at Manhattan. Um, and that it's become New York City's shared space for art and play. So we'll turn to the video for, it's a couple minutes, because you'll get to, see, you'll unfortunately hear a little bit more of me and probably saying the same things, but you'll see uh, real visitors talking about the island. So if we can turn the video on. Quite a big area for everyone to enjoy. I mean, we're we're excited. We came here, pretty ready for our, our nice family picnic. Governor's Island's a 172-acre island in the middle of New York Harbor, and a big part of what we do here is uh, encourage all kinds of arts and culture, the broadest definition. In a five-minute boat ride, you come to a place where you experience the sea and sky, and also all kinds of creativity. Coming from the city. This, this whole island in general, the atmosphere is like really nice and just totally different. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it feels secluded from the city. It's not like loud, you know, you can walk around, everyone's happy. What's really exciting about today is we just opened this park. I'm sitting in a park that opened a few hours ago. 
And what's amazing is people are using it as if it's been here forever. I think public art is cool. It gives you more a chance to kind of inspect it. I think public art is more creative because you know you can climb on it and stuff like that. And I don't know, I just like sculpture. In the public setting, you can, you know, get yourself in, immersed in the art. And I think that's amazing. Well, we haven't actually written anything in a while, so I thought it'd be cool to come out here to a place that we haven't been to before. And with all the modern art and all the new hype around it, I thought it'd be a really cool place to kind of try something new. Being in a nice field and just seeing all these people out here exploring, and that was sparking some. Uh, Stuff. Fire. <laughs> Some fire under the back. <laughs> we want to have our kids exposed to everything, like all types of cultures, and we think art is definitely an important part, something that they really enjoy anyway. Since you know our society is pretty tech savvy and everything is electronics, it's very important to maintain that outdoorsy cultural nature exposure for them. There's another piece here that you can't see because it's a sculpture in sound. The artist Susan Phillips uses often her voice, but in this case, a very popular and familiar tune to respond to the particular history of a place. Governor's Island is a former military base, so Susan chose to work with a very familiar tune, the bugle call of taps. And every evening when you leave the island, uh, you will be able to hear Susan's reimagining of taps. But the art is not just in this new park, there's art everywhere. Uh, we're working on the Achilles of Giraffe. It's a 17-foot digital fabrication piece, one-to-one -one scale, about the real height of a real giraffe. It came up to over 450 pieces, and we're assembling it now. Using the geometric shapes like triangles, it sort of represents us as architects too. So instead of trying to be something curvy or something very close to what a giraffe would look like, we would use abstract shapes and really, you know, help people understand that as architects we don't necessarily always build buildings but we can build many other things with the tools that we're given. We're building something interactive for all of them who come here during the summer. It has chalkboard paint on it so everybody that participates can write all over it so the piece is sort of ever transforming into whatever people want to make it. It's been really exciting to see how the island has been activated this first day. It's a good place for people to enjoy the nature and also get acquainted with the arts and mm. maybe even participate. So these are reclaimed plastic cups and in the end 30,000 clear plastic cups will be reincarnated or art incarnated into this installation. The goal also was like um, transform the trash into something really intricate and, and beautiful. It's significant for us as architects to be involved like this, to be able to offer our work for the delight of the greater public. Art, culture, and design were always at the heart of how Governor's Island came back to life and will be at the heart of why people enjoy this beautiful place going forward, really, for the time immemorial. We build this as a, a bit of a conversation with you all, I, I, but I don't know if you've ever had a conversation where there are stadium Klieg lights in your eyes. So I, I can see you, but if I'm squinting, if we're squinting, that's why. But, but we're going to have a little bit of a conversation, um, but we really want to open it up to you as well. Um, and, and part of the reason is I, I promised Leslie, and I'm, I'm not going to put her on the spot, and she was very clear in it, and for good reason. She said, look, uh, one of the reasons we wanted to invite Leslie was not only is Governor's Island an incredible new resource for the region, so we hope you'll all go and enjoy it, but because we saw, uh, certainly I felt and, and others, um, that there were many things that we could learn uh, from, uh, from Governor's Island for, for the city of Hartford, for downtown, and for, for the IQIL. And um, I'm sure in, in many of you have been drawing some of those connections yourselves, and, and I'm sure you're inspired and have lots of ideas, and it, it's an inspiring place. Um, 
So let me start with a couple of things. One is, um, and, and so I, so Leslie was clear, please don't, you know, I, don't ask me to sort of make an assessment of what you guys are doing of Hartford because I'm too new to it and I don't really know and I'm not going to ask you to do that, but, but I'm going to try and draw a few connections that, that I'm getting and, you know, I'm not going to ask you to validate it one way or the other. But I definitely will have some questions for you about Governor's Island and then I'll try to draw some parallels for, for us because we do want to learn. I mean, there's so much to learn. We could all just go to the island and study it for a long time. And, and, uh, but, there's, but you've also made it very accessible, too. And I think that's at the heart of what you're doing, the accessibility of it, the language you use and the, the themes. Um, uh, let's, um, I want to start a little bit with the notion of parks and culture or outdoor culture, because <clears throat> the i is based on the premise that cities compete. The, it's a very competitive world out there from city to city. We're competing for talent. We're competing for dollars, all kinds of things. So what could Hartford compete on? And Hartford, as Carol Coletta memorably said, punches above its weight in art and culture. We're, by many measures, for a city of our size and, and, uh, and challenges in other areas, we're very strong in terms of the arts and culture, and particularly institutions. But I think culture, having grown up here, was really something you did inside. You went inside to the symphony. You went inside to the Athenaeum, um, <clears throat> to the Hartford stage, to this wonderful theater. Um, and then now and then we'd get some public art outside, Stegosaurus, which everyone loves, and Stonefield Sculpture, which is controversial, but our idea of culture outdoors has been pretty limited. And we aren't, <clears throat> the city is now doing some very, very good programming. But I think it's not just Hartford. I think generally the idea of culture has evolved. <clears throat> the idea of public art has greatly evolved. And uh, one thing that so struck us is that since the iQuilt is a, is a culture-based plan, that people weren't sure at first, well, why are you so focused on parks, on the Green Walk and connecting Bushnell Park? Is that really culture? And we said, well, that's part of it. We have these institutions, <clears throat> but outdoors. <clears throat> Can you talk a little bit? Um, you, have, you have buildings and you have some culture going on inside, but you've got a lot of culture going on outside. Can you talk about some of the challenges of that? And, and even something as banal, you didn't mention weather. And I kind of want to know, what happens when there's a pouring rain and a thunderstorm uh, when you got I'm you really got five lonely out there. And you got 10, <laughs> well, or what if, what if they've shown up and it was sunny in the morning and then you have 10,000 people on the island in a rainstorm? Wet. What you happens? Wet. That's right, they're not going to melt. Um, uh, it, so I'll answer the weather question first. The only thing that we worry about, of course, is lightning, because um, we don't want anyone to die. Um, and then heavy wind, because that's the only thing that shuts down the boat. So people do get wet occasionally, but uh, New Yorkers are you know, not so hardy when it comes to weather, so that they've learned to be. Um, outdoor is obviously incredibly important. I think we think more in terms of what I would call informality, um, participation, and sort of hanging out. And I think what's happened in the world, and I'm old, I'm 52, um, my generation, you know, performance took place in theaters, visual art took place in museums, and food was in restaurants. If I talk to anyone younger than me, they have no, they're just, those boundaries are just over. Um, and uh, everything is about experiences. And this is also true whether it's for-profit or not-for-profit. You know, if you're 26, you don't say, I'm going to a for-profit club to hear a band, and I'm going to a not-for-profit. Um, and and then the other thing is that anyone can create an experience. Um, and those experiences don't fit within those boundaries. So I think what outdoors does is it, it breaks down those boundaries for the creator um, and for the audience, right? Because it's outside. You can be more relaxed. I'll try things that I wouldn't otherwise try. The other thing that's been interesting for us and is that a lot of our stuff is created by, like, and just to be really clear, like the people who created that draft, I've never met them. I have no idea who they are. Um, I watched the video, I've watched that video a few times now, but I, I don't know where they came from or how they got to Governor's Island. Um, so we have lots of people like that. We also have traditional institutions, the International Center of Photography, New York Historical Society, Cooper Hewitt, you name it. And they're co now coming to Governor's Island. And the reason they're coming is because we have a big audience, eight to 10,000 people. They're largely local, right, not tourists. But also the institutions are able to connect to people in a different way than they can on Fifth Avenue or in their, you know, whatever their institutional box is. And that becomes really important. And what you see is people like my husband, who's a theater producer, but you know, I would have to hold a gun to his head to get him to go to something in visual art. He'll go on Governor's Island, not just because I work there, because it's informal. And there's not, you know, there's not the secret handshake of I'm going into a museum. And the other thing is that we've seen is that um, there's a lot of opportunity to meet the creator. 
And even in a city like New York, which you think of as a cultural city, you know, most people have never met an artist, you know, and, or any kind of artist, a playwright, an actor. Mm -hmm. And so the opportunity to see the work being created, um, one of our stats up there is about all these sort of workshops and open rehearsals. So to me, it's really about informality. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I would say, and we were talking about this as we were walking through Bushnell, hanging out. People want to hang out. Right? And people talk about hanging out online, right? They do that. But people, that's, that's kind of what people do, and that's what parks give you um, any kind of public space. You know, the library in Hartford, we had lunch there. That's a great place to hang out. Um, lots of public spaces. Carol Coletta talks a lot about the idea of the civic commons. You know, how do you create hanging out places where we get out of our cars, we get out of our backyards, we get out of our apartments? And in a city like New York, where people have so little private space, they're by definition in the public space much more of the time. Sometimes that's you know places they pay for, it's like restaurants. Sometimes it's free space. But this notion of sort of hanging out and being then open to cultural experiences is what we think about. And I think that's what outdoors and in our case, just to be clear, our indoor spaces, right? They don't look like fancy museums. They're as is houses. Mm -hmm. So yes, they're indoors, and yes, that that makes it easy for like a painter or a sculptor to sort of present work or someone to do a dance performance indoors, but um, they're definitely a house. They're definitely not an institution, mm -hmm. and so those boundaries don't exist that people my generation grew up with. <clears throat> Two things I just want to respond to, and again, doing, doing this sort of um, speaking the language of, of Hartford and, tr and translating a bit. The notion of sh that, that the space is shared, I think, is so important because um, in, in Hartford, like many cities, the downtown, we've defined it in, in our sort of outreach as the shared living room for the whole city. In other words, neighborhoods have their own parks and they have their own hangouts, but we think it's an appropriate model for Hartford that the downtown is the place where everybody gets to hang out, belongs to everyone. So that sense of sharing it uh, and really opening up to everyone, the Kanish theory, is, is great. And I think, um, I think this city doesn't really have that tradition of, of welcoming and, and opening up public space. I draw a little bit, and I draw an interesting, an, an additional conclusion in terms of what we've been doing here uh, on the, with the IQO partnership for the last seven years. I think we had the wrong terms. I mean, yeah, we, we do tend to use jargony terms. We, we'll, we'll, we'll really work on avoiding it. But we had this uh, a kind of strategy, which was to externalize your assets. We talked to all the cultural institutions, because we have these big, not informal institutions, very formal institutions with formal buildings, with classical columns and entry sequences and staircases, and that can be quite intimidating. The people who don't know, who aren't, who didn't grow up going to museums, those can be barriers to to the art. So they're very, they've been very formal. We said externalize your assets. You've got great stuff. You've got art. You've got music, theater, performance, dance. But people don't know. It's Hartford tends to hide its assets inside behind rather intimidating buildings. You've made me see that that's not enough. It's not enough to externalize the assets. Yet it's, it's going further. It's actually engaging. Yeah, sorry, I can't even say engaging. See, I fell into the <laughs> trap. How do we? It's, it's just welcoming people. It's getting them involved. It's making them feel like they're, it's for them. It's by them. That sense of participation. So it's a real challenge, I think, to our wonderful arts institutions here to go even further. Having an outside presence is good because it signals come on in. But it's got to be, it's actually moving the institution outside as much as possible. And, and I think you have to just really believe that you want everyone there and not just say it. And I mean, that's why I tell the Kanish story. I mean, my team will tell you I was obsessed with this. Like, you know, we had lots and lots of people coming to the island, and that was great because, again, if you know the sort of geography of New York, um, the Hasidic community tends to stay in their own community. And so the fact that they were doing all the same things, and it's amazing to watch. You'd have women in Shador, you'd have Hasidic families, but they couldn't eat. You know, and, and this made me insane. Mm. And so, I mean, this was a multi-year quest for a Kanish. Um, but it was also that in my quest, that was also signaling to everyone who worked on the island what it meant to be welcoming. And we had an episode that I won't go into, but it was an episode involving two of our visitors that almost became a very charged episode. And I had a security guard who gets paid you know, $15 an hour who diffused that episode because it is instilled in our culture you know, everyone is welcome. We are, you know, so mm. we didn't call the 911. We're going to, you know, and 
And I happened to have an elected official who watched it and called me to tell me about it and praise kind of our diversity and our attitudes. So that's what I mean. Mm -hmm. It's like not just the fun stuff, but it really is. And I will tell you, I go, and I'm not going to use a Hartford example. Um, I go into places and I can tell you how I, as an upper class, middle-aged white woman, don't feel totally welcome. And I don't mean discriminated against. I mean that the place is not welcome. It's intimidating. And then I think, well, what would it be like if I were a 16-year-old of whatever race, or I didn't speak English perfectly? And, and just every place you walk into, um, you can find ways that you can be more welcoming to people um, and, that, and feel really comfortable and excited that you are sharing whoever you are, whatever institution you are responsible for, are sharing that experience. Because that's what, I mean, I'm a little D, I'm a big D Democrat too, but that's what democracy is about. And that's what's going, you know, when you look at some of the conversation going on in our country right now, we are a country founded on diversity. And that metaphor of the shared living room is a beautiful metaphor, and that's why we use shared space. What does it mean for a space truly to be shared? And, and the other thing I'll say is when I started in this job, I mentioned that people, you know, I wondered if I was crazy, but the biggest problem we had, of course, was that nobody lives there, so there are no constituents, and we're publicly funded, right? So that seemed like, you know, sort of dead in the water. But what's happened is because nobody lives there, everybody shares it, right? And so everybody's equal. And you don't have the turf and the sort of this is my park and the evil eye, you know, from the, this, you know, these mothers looking at. And that has really uh, been incredible. And the, the shared boat experience really accentuates that. But that's been incredibly important to that feeling. And now there's a whole city that really has equity in this very odd place. I mean, yeah, that's what I tell people about other cities. Like, if you can turn an abandoned island that nobody can sleep there into a shared place that people have so much emotion about, you know, any place can become sort of the love center of a community. I mean, I, I think that's something <clears throat> Hartford can definitely learn because there's certainly groups which, you know, have not, have not felt that downtown, since that's the focus of the world, has belonged to them or that they're welcome or that they're welcome sometimes but not others or in some places. There isn't that long, the, 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 there's actually a history of strife that, that's associated with that. Um, <clears throat> but also, you know, we're a, a sort of, a working town, a sort of Yankee New England town, and there isn't that kind of Italian warm and welcoming feeling as, as you know, part of the tradition. Don Poland is a resident who runs a, a you know, a, a, he'll guide tourists around downtown, and he just had a long online description of his experience with a couple of Australians who were visiting Hartford, and he said it, it was, they had, there was no support, there was no infrastructure for welcoming. We didn't have the culture of hotel concierges who know to tell people where to go, just basic information for visitors. So that's for, that's for outsiders. And I think even, even insiders, even residents of the region, of, of the city, and even of downtown, th that's a wonderful goal to sort of figure out how can we say welcome to everyone. Food is critical, and we have a lot of great restaurants uh, now downtown. A lot of them are quite expensive, and it isn't necessarily available on the street. We have some food trucks, but I think that's a, that's a rich area for exploration and for expansion. We were talking about today, you said immediately, okay, so how many food trucks? It's like, that's a good question. Has anyone counted the food trucks? Has anyone mapped them? Has anyone done the kind of research that you've done to help promote that sort of, th that basic need of food on the street? Let me switch a little bit to public versus private, because you, you know, your background's perfect, because you've, you know, you've got the private sector experience and now and, and public, and you've obviously made great gains about um, you, you made, uh, had enormous accomplishment bringing them together. There's an old saw that the public sector, the job of the public sector is to plow the field, and then the private sector comes and plants the seeds. There's a kind of sequence there. In other words, the public sector gets in first, that may not always be true, but according to that, the public sector has a job to sort of prepare the way, and then the public se sector investment follows. Um, you had uh, a, a certain a significant amount of funding which you invested enormously into public space and infrastructure. And now, people don't realize it, but Leslie's job is really as a, as, as a developer, as a real, to, to get real estate development and investment on the island. So I, I think at heart, you really are a public space creator. That, it's clear that's where your heart is, but your job, it says, now we've got a, there's a lot of land to develop. So you have told us that you're now in the, starting the business, having done all this investment of issuing RFPs to get private investment to come to the island, and there are a number of challenges. Can you talk a little bit about 
that relationship of private investment versus the role of the public sector in, in doing what you're doing? Well, for example, you couldn't drink the water on Governor's Island because it wasn't potable. So that seemed like a public sector. That seemed like our side of the ledger. That was pretty clear. <laughs> um, but it was also transformation. You saw one of my early slides. I mean, it was truly derelict landfill. And as beautiful as the ice cream part was, you know, it was a big distraction that half the island, you know, looked like East, uh, Eastern Germany um, before the wall fell. So. Um, that was sort of necessary. So in, in, in effect, we're you know, creating uh, land value. But it's also, when you think about cities, and you know, there's a whole lot of conversation now. Like People are moving downtown. They're moving downtown in Hartford and Grand Rapids, you know, in Tampa, and obviously in, around the world, in the third world, right? It, it, this is the urban century, right? That, and that's, it, we're not going back. And so you have to say, what is it that makes cities desirable? And why do people put up with living in a city like New York, where it's ridiculously expensive? because there's this sort of ferment and activity. And so for us, as we developed this work and the island has grown, we now make a larger case, which is we're adding value to the city. Because this idea that there's this sort of open platform where all kinds of sort of cultural entrepreneurs can create experiences actually still makes New York vital. Um, and that's why people put up with paying $1,000 to share an apartment in Bushwick, which is what they pay now, um, because they get to do all these things. That's why people live in cities, right? Because you're trading off, right? You can live in other places where you have more private space, but you don't have that ferment. So it's my real job is, as you said, economic development, finding tenants. We have our first commercial tenant coming online at Destination Day Spa. Um, their revenue will help increase our boat schedule um, and contribute to our bottom line. But we also look really fundamentally at kind of what's going on in cities broadly and what makes people want to live in cities, right? Because there's a fundamental trade-off. And it's not just anymore the young, right, who want to live in cities. In New York City, we're seeing you know, tons of people with kids. We're seeing tons of empty nesters. There's this phrase, norks, naturally occurring retirement communities. Cities are the best place to grow old, right? I don't have to drive my car. There's lots of things to do. So what are the things that you need to do in a city? So that's the public responsibility to sort of lay that table. Um, and uh, in our case, it was some basic stuff like the seawall so the island didn't float away, water, but also we had to transform it. It wasn't really a choice. Um, we took down you know, 35 buildings. You can look online and watch us implode a building. It's quite fun to watch. Um, we turned that into a little drama, but that was our responsibility, and it will still be a long haul for us to find tenants, fill all those buildings, um, but we're now answering a larger question about the vitality of New York. And remember, uh, you know, we're funded by the mayor of the city of New York, so we have to answer those larger questions because every day the mayor is, is answering other questions about priorities. So the fact that we're filling not just a public space and recreational need, but kind of a more fundamental kind of uh, innovation economy need um, it becomes important. So uh, some of those basic things like water and, and uh, the seawalls and so forth are obvious public utilities yeah. that have to be cared for, but you went further. You took $75 million and created a new public park, uh, the, the wonderful one that we saw. So, you know, public, the public sector does more than just, you know, get the pipes in, that the public sector actually revitalizes public space as, as a, in, not in every case perhaps, but in many cases, as a very good anti first step before uh -huh. private development comes in. Are private developers attracted to that? I mean, I think they're beginning to, but it, we, we very clearly both strategically said, we want to set, this is an island, so if you have like crappy public space or crappy building first, you know, it, it really does affect the next chapter. So it's a, it's a sequencing question that I think um, is perhaps not unique to the island, but very uh, sort of acute for the island. Um, and we wanted to make it a destination. So we, we said like this has to be a must-do place so that what you don't see in the video because it's not yet built is the next phase of park are hills in the harbor that give you a 360 degree view of the Statue of Liberty and all of New York, um, which is the next phase actually a public-private partnership. And th the reason for that design uh, by a brilliant landscape architect is how do you make Governor's Island this must-do place that where you come to New York and you say to your friends, you have to go to this place. And by the way, it'll be the only place in New York that's going to be free where you can see the sights and height. You know, so ironically, right, the city of skyscrapers, skyscrapers are for the wealthy. Um, the observatory just announced their prices uh, in the new uh, One World Trade Center, um, or whatever it's called. 
used to be called the Freedom Tower, um, and it's uh, $35. Mm. So I'm not going. You know, New Yorkers are not going. Mm. Um, and so that symbolism of a place that you can experience the statue. So, so for us, the public space strategy was not just like roll out some grass because no one was going to come. Mm. So we could have spent $10 million, let's say, I, don't, I can't do the math, you know, on how much a very basic park would have cost. It would have been a waste of money because you wouldn't have come. Now, pe you know, people are coming because there are these unique experiences, um, art and landscape and views and bike paths. Um, and people, what, what you get a little bit of in the video, but you really have to come visit to experience, is you just feel like you've left the city behind. It's 30 acres of new park. It feels like infinity because you have the sea and the sky. And that is a feeling you carry with you. Um, and so, and but we knew that, and that's why the design had to be at that level. Because when we started, my favorite story, and we should probably open it up to the rest, is when I was starting the competition, and I called people, you know, who should be in this competition. And this man said, "Well, I have the greatest landscape architects for you. I've got two. And I said, "Great. What are their names?" He goes, "They're both dead: Frederick Law Olmsted and Frederick Law Olmsted <laughs> Jr." And in fact, when we started, the biggest question I got when we started a park competition was, why bother? New York City already has the greatest park in the world. Why bother creating a park with a view of the Statue of Liberty? Nobody goes to the Statue of Liberty. And these were very informed New Yorkers, many, many of them, completely dismissing the entire premise that what you saw in that video mm. would be something that people would want to see and do. So um, that I mean, I think that's sort of another lesson, which is you to listen to people, but you also have to really kind of know your place and know what it is that that place can offer people um, and how that fits into the rest of their lives. And it goes back to the question, how could I convince you to come on a Saturday? Well, that looks like a place you might want to come. Trust me, you know, when we started, you know, you would come for 20 minutes and then go, well, where's the next boat? But should we open it up to? I have one question, one comment and then one question, and then I will open up. So the, the comment, what we, we've talked about it. So interestingly, one of the parallels is that you had an island uh, which had a lot of flat open space, and you had to convince a lot of people to, to come there. Uh, it's about 170 acres. Um, downtown Hartford, 300 acres, and it's been kind of an island. And we have to convince people to come there, not, not because, and we don't have a boat ride to offer them to get here. We have traffic on 84, or, and I'm talking about the larger region, not folks who live in downtown or in Hartford and might bike or walk, but, but those from the region, because we, any downtown not, needs not only a small municipality, which, which Hartford is, but, but the region. Uh, so that idea of what is it that will make it, and it's almost the antithesis. Uh, everyone in the surrounding areas has lots of, they have hammocks, they don't need hammocks. What they need is the vibrancy of an urban center that they don't get in Simsbury or, or Glastonbury or wherever else. So I think the flip side is an intense place of, of, of great crowds and, and, and variety and diversity. Um, that, but it is a kind of island problem that we have, and I think that's, that's been the challenge. Uh, the last question, though, has to do with design itself, asking as a designer. And, and we had an interesting conversation before where, you know, yes, I mean, there's clearly a role for design, um, and you're very happy that you had Dutch designers because they knew how to deal with flooding and, and put everything high up, and you survived Sandy very well. Um, but there's also, design is not the answer to everything, and in fact, we we're talking about down to the level of furnishings and the kind of chairs. You were saying, uh, we had some custom design furniture, forget it, we just did off the shelf. And sometimes it's not about design, it's how cool it looks, or it's about, it's about just economy, but also kind of a flexibility. Can you talk a little bit about just the elements of furnishing public space? Sure. Um, and we had the most amazing designer, uh, Adrian Huizer, who's Dutch, uh, his firm is called West Eight, and uh, you got a sense of that in some of the images, but uh, he's, he's truly extraordinary. But we were incredibly involved clients in every little detail, you know, how high the seed edge would be, um, where the trees were planted, all of that, and always speaking for the public, you know, kind of, is, this, is that going to be a comfortable place to sit? Um, not just is it going to be a beautiful place to sit? Um, so we... We thought a lot about, um, actually, Adrian, there were sort of two things. One was uh, movable chairs, and the other, actually, I'll talk a little bit about bicycles. So in both cases, there were insights that Adrian had 
back in 2007 when we first met him, and he said, if you have movable chairs, then people will colonize, I can't really do his Dutch accent, colonize the space and sort of claim it as their own. And at the time that that, you know, people thought movable chairs was the Luxembourg Gardens, right? That's, and so that's when we did hammocks, and we also have Adirondack chairs, right? So we sort of took it, we kept on taking his ideas and working with them and then going one step farther. Um, and, you know, because no one had ever thought about putting Adirondack chairs and hammocks in a public space before, and we found that people used them like seating. We actually also had these funky, um, I don't think we have any pictures of them, movable benches. They're like wheelbarrows, and we found it was like open source, and we had our handymen make them. So we were like, we're really into movable furniture. You could move it like a wheelbarrow. You know, and people loved it because it was so weird. Um, and um, one of our favorite images was this wedding, this um, sort of renegade, it was actually a pirate wedding. Um, literally a pirate wedding. So uh, they, this couple decided to have a pop-up wedding in Governor's Island. They took those wheelbarrow benches and they wheeled them so they were like little pews facing the Statue of Liberty. But then the groom's side decided to dress as pirates, but they didn't tell the bride's side. And so I got this call on the radio that there were pirates on the ship on the ferry, and for a second I actually thought there were pirates on the ferry, and I like, it's like, I, I haven't thought about that, but they were just, anyway. Um, but it was this idea of like truly colonizing space, like that had not occurred to us, that you could turn them into pews and have a wedding for 100 people in the middle of a public park. So it was sort of putting stuff out and then seeing what people could mm -hmm. do with it. Um, Picnic Point, which we showed a picture of the hammocks, everything there was red, right? So we, we decided to sort of experiment, but while we were designing the park, um, the island, the only part of the island that had been open was sort of the beautiful historic island. We were designing a park that was in the open part of the island with these views of the statue. We said, well, we need experience. We need, we need people to go out there. And like, so we made up a safety reason and we demolished a bunch of buildings and we had this sod. And then we went to the store and we bought red Adirondack chairs, red hammocks, um, red picnic tables and red swings, right? Everything off the shelf. But because they were all red, oh, and then somebody <coughs> gave us these old red shipping containers. So like all of a sudden we had designed something, right? Because it was all red. Um, and of course no one in the design community paid any attention to it because it wasn't designed, because it wasn't Adrian's work. But it was like, it felt like a place. But the other thing that we did, um, and this goes back to our obsession with words, is we named it. So we named it Picnic Point. And we, of course, made up that name. And at the time, nobody in New York picnicked, right? Because people in New York eat takeout and like street food. And so we you know, tore down these buildings, laid out the sod. We made the contractor stay late at night. We held the boat. The only time we've ever had to do that where we just said, you're staying here. We're not running the boat <laughs> until you finish. We put out our picnic tables. Like, and then we just, like, stood at the ferry the next day, the first day of 2009 season. We said, we could be really stupid because no one in New York walks off the grid a mile, right? Nobody does that, and nobody picnics. And sure enough, but we had this advantage, right? We had the Statue of Liberty right there. And all of a sudden, people came, and then everybody came, and that became their favorite place mm -hmm. on the island. And then while we were doing um, sort of wayfinding research, we found out that that was the most recognizable place name on Governor's Island, more than Castle Williams, which had been there since 1810, <laughs> because it was a name that made sense. So it's sort of like we created mm -hmm. identity by buying a bunch of red things. I was adamant they had to be red. Um, and then that we gave it a name, and all of a sudden it became a place. So I mean, those mm. are the kinds of things you do that, you know, in retrospect, you know, they, it's a good story. But we were just really making it up as we went along. I mean, what I love is the experimentation, and I think that's something. Again, here we can learn. Just try stuff, see what works. But you also do your homework. I mean, you do the research ahead of time, you put it out, and you also test it. And then if it's not working, you change. And that's a kind of commitment to the ongoing sort of furnishing a public space that you know that I think. Not not every city has the capacity or the commitment to do so. So we can take a lesson from that. Uh, so you've had. I gave you a little advance warning that questions are coming up. So everybody's been formulating. I hope lots of questions. So who would like to start? This gentleman right here. I presume that there's no entrance fee, but is there a cost for the boat? And if they don't bring their bicycles, can they rent them on the island? Um, there is now. The, this summer was the first summer we charged two dollars round trip. Uh, up until then, it was free. Um, and that's just, you know, it costs a lot of money to run the boat. Um, and you can bring your own bicycles. The other thing that we did was we, back in 2008, offered free bicycles. So we actually went to the bike concessionaire, and this is an example of like, like with policies where you can do things that aren't typical. So 
we had this idea that like free bikes would be great. Bike share didn't exist. This is before City Bike, and I think they were just starting in Paris. And we also wanted this to be a place that was diverse, that people from all of New York would come. And we realized that like, how would I have a bike in New York if I live in an apartment and I'm a kid? You know, like there's nowhere to store it. There's nowhere safe to ride it. And the bike advocacy community had no idea what we were talking about because they were like, bikes, everyone rides bikes, great. And I'm like, no, that's not true. So we said, bike rental's not for tourists, it's for New Yorkers. And we went to the bike concessionaire and we said, if you um, off, we will take less money from you if you take the money from, some of the money from renting bikes on the weekends, at the time we were open three days a week, to have free bike Fridays. So all the bikes were free on Governor's Island. And that was one of the most important things in making it a lively space for New Yorkers at a time when, this is before City Bike, you know, m the sort of typical person on a bike in New York was a 27-year-old white guy. All of a sudden we had thousands, literally three to 5,000 kids every Friday of every shape, size, and color in New York coming to ride bikes for the first time. Mm -hmm. So you can bring your own bike. We have 600 bikes on the island. We also have these things called bike surreys. You might have seen in the pictures, those funny, um, I insisted on those as well. Um, and those are not free ever. Um, and, uh, and now, because we're open seven days a week, all the bikes are free uh, on weekday mornings from 10 to 12. Hmm. Long answer to your question. This gentleman here. Hey. Yes. Hi. Um, I always think it's interesting to talk about, sometimes more interesting the stuff that doesn't work than the stuff that does. Can you tell me a little bit about, is there a couple of things you wish to go wow, I wish I could do that? Wish I didn't do it? Well, the, the famous one, and it's good because it wasn't really my fault, was uh, what, what is referred to as the uh, food truck clusterfuck uh, on Governor's Island. <laughs> you can actually Google that. That's not my phrase. Um, which was, uh, because we don't fund anything, right? We have this open invitation, so it's kind of up to you creating experience. We don't, like, audit, you know? Like, you're, we don't look at your art in advance, and we don't check your refrigerator to see that if you're planning a food truck festival, you actually have enough food. So Labor Day weekend on an island... 10,000 people, not so much food and food trucks was really not a good day <laughs> on Governor's <laughs> Island. So um, that didn't work. And we actually learned that like th those kinds of festivals, you know, we need a little more uh, sort of intervention. Um, it's been more that like we have a whole list of ideas that haven't happened because we don't fund anything or produce anything. So my wacky idea list is still long. Um, so if you'd like, we, I really wanted a corn maze, but now we've built a beautiful park. So I think I, I think I have to give up on the corn maze, but we still have a long list of things we'd love people to do um, that nobody's come up with yet, so. Please. Oh, okay, I'm, oh, go ahead and then, and then behind you, yeah. We don't have a marketing budget, so it's zero. Um, so that was kind of hard. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm sorry, I think we used to have $25,000, now we're at zero. Um, <laughs> and uh, so we make a little brochure, we have a not very good website, and then we do three things. Um, we make it a great experience so everybody talks about it and tells their friends, that's obviously the most important thing. We do do social media, um, and we sort of started doing that early, pretty early. Um, and then the other thing is that the media comes and we get really lovely press coverage. And we work that, so like, you know, I spend a lot of my time in that, but, but really the reason that we get so much press coverage is because the press gets that this is like really something different than like the usual cultural, you know, or commercial offering. And so they, most of the greatest stories that came out this summer we had nothing to do with. And, you know, as much as we may talk about social media, like the New York Times still really matters. Um, and those articles in the New York Times really matter. Um, so I would say those are the three things, but the most important thing by far is word of mouth. Hmm. People tell their friends, you know, and, that, and the other thing that's interesting when you talk about kind of what's going on with the audience, people want to experience culture with their friends now. So the sort of, and, then, and, it's, and it's actually generational. Like there's a different behavior in people under 35. So people don't come to Governors Down by themselves, they come with their friends and family, and then they tell other people about it. Maureen. Yeah. Um, I think it's fabulous what you've done. Congratulations. And I'm a public event producer, and I'm really intrigued with just how spontaneous and how full your space seems. But how do you handle the liability issues that we have to deal with here in Hartford and all of our Connecticut cities, and some of the permitting issues when there is such a spontaneous feel to 
the artists and the groups that you're yeah. in. So we have a permit process. Uh, the permit looks like the same permit you would use to play Little League. Um, it's not really any different from any uh, the, from the permits you would see to do an event in a city park. The difference is that we start with yes. So you want to do a unicycle festival. Great. Um, here's the permit. If you were having that conversation with a municipal park, I, I, well, I'll tell you a story, because I sort of always say this, and then I was talking to an event producer who does this porch stomp, which was on our map, and he wanted to do like a little parade, like he was doing a brass band, and he was going to walk through a city park, and they were like, well, but you would make so much noise. What happens if someone was having a wedding somewhere in that park? You would disturb their wedding, and I was like, First of all, people don't really have, aren't supposed to have weddings in parks. But it was like literally, every, and you, if you have more than 20 people, would we have to make you have a permit for each group of 20? Because that's our policy. But he started saying it. I thought it was like a Saturday Night Live skit of everything that I feared. So we just start with yes. And so you come to us. You have to, you have to get insurance. It usually costs three or $400. That's for some groups, that's their only expense. But then we're just like, we're going to help you figure out how to do this. We've had theater festivals with cows. We've had dogs starring. <laughs> I mean, we've had... All kinds of wacky stuff happen. We care about safety, so we never break the rules on safety. So two modes of egress, you know, those sort of basic stuff. Um, and but but really, it's really attitude. And I think that the challenge for a lot of in a lot of cities is nobody really owns this, and so the health department has these rules about food handling. The streets department has these rules, and what I've talk to other cities about is for when you want to do large events is really having someone in the mayor's office who says like I want this event to take place and you're going to tell me XYZ agency why it can't in our case we work with the city and so obviously everything that happens on Governor's Island we're not a separate you know principality it's all legal in New York um, but we start with yes and that takes us really far I've got a number of questions coming yeah, right here yes Yes, people are very positive. <laughs> yes, they are. It's true. I'm interested, uh, there's always this debate, you, you create these great public spaces, but the debate is do you need to then program around those public spaces to draw people to them? <clears throat> it sounds like most of what you've done is create the public spaces and then let the spontaneity and the creativity find the spaces and do it. Is that yeah. So we've really created the platform, and it is definitely true that on the days, on like a Saturday where we have the jazz lawn party, we have more visitors. So you know we're very much a program. You know our t attendance is very much programming driven. Um, but the really important thing, and I think what the public gets is that, and and we see this in, uh, you know, in New York now, you're actually seeing conserv in the in the well-funded sort of conservancy managed parks, the High Line, Brooklyn Bridge Park, Central Park, more programming. So there's a little bit more of a shift. But it's one sensibility. And like, I have a particular sensibility, but like, th that's not the sensibility that you see on Governor's Island. People do not believe that I don't select the things, but I don't. Um, and I certainly don't produce them. So the virtue of having the platform is that the public can feel that it's so diverse. And then all these people have equity in your space. Not just the visitors, but the people who create it. So one of the most moving stories when Hurricane Sandy hit New York, so it's 48 hours later, you know, Manhattan has no power, lots of people are evacuated. All the calls we got were, for, and, right, and I have an abandoned island. I mean, it's, it's, no one lives there, right? So no one can be hurt. The art, it was arts groups who called me, saying, is the island okay? You know, and that's sort of an amazing thing. I mean, these were people, you know, people who were themselves experiencing an enormous amount of dislocation. So the virtue of sort of having that open platform and not producing it yourself is that then people have equity because we're giving them that space. You know, the unicycle guy, he's in year five. I mean, a lot of these projects you see here, they're in their fourth year, their fifth year, um, and they, are, they have created this experience. Um, not, we haven't created it. So that's my philosophy, which is not always shared by other programming organizations in public spaces. Yes, ma'am. Uh, that's a terrific uh, presentation. Thank lots you. to learn from. Uh, one of the things you said really um, kind of piqued my curiosity. You said a lot of the traditional August organizations are starting to really lay down roots with programming. Just uh, curious to know the types of things uh, that they're doing. We have some challenge here trying to get those large organizations to commit to externalizing assets, to investing in public programming, because they can't see the payback. Exactly. Right. 
And so, A, what kinds of things are they doing? And B, is it truly to tell that there is a payback and a pathway being created back to those? Yeah. I think it really gets to how you define success. It was interesting. I was having a conversation with an, a small cultural the other day, and they were asking that same question, like, you know, uh, can we track how many people come to visit our institution? And I said, you know, you may be able to, and the Corning Museum of Glass, which is very far away, told us that people came to Corning having discovered their glass because they did a hot chop on Governor's Island one summer. But I said, that's, to me, that's really the wrong question because it really gets to, like, the mission. So. We are not the right place if you're a museum that has, you know, archival objects. We don't have climate control. You know, you have to determine your own security. So we're, the Metropolitan Museum is not going to bring paintings to Governor's Island, and I'm not going to ask them to. But if you really think about what is a museum about and what is curating about, it's about telling a narrative of a cultural experience. And you can do that in a lot of settings. And so I think the notion, and what I said to you, I said, you know, Think about, you can get visibility, you, you could get an article in the press if you create a unique experience. You're located in a particular community. This group was in Brooklyn Heights. A lot of people aren't gonna go to Brooklyn Heights because it reads as a certain kind of wealthy community in New York, so you're gonna get a more diverse audience. But really fundamentally, I think museums have to ask themselves, what business are we in? <laughs> um, and that, and if the bu that business is not just getting people in our building, the business is providing the narrative of what is culture, right? And depending on what the museum's expertise is. Um, and that's hard for some museums. Um, what we've seen from, and Center of Photography's come back three times, the New York Historical Society's come back a couple of times. Um, they're creating different kinds of experiences because they feel the freedom. So they did crowdsource uh, show of photographs taken by the public of Occupy Wall Street. Uh, the New York Historical Society had their student historians, their high school historians, curate ob curated a show, obviously not archival objects, from their big World War II exhibit. So those are things that not only they wouldn't do in the museum, but they would read really differently, right? In the beautiful, gorgeous museum, they would look kind of funny. Um, and so I think that's a good experience, but I think that you know museums are really struggling now with like what is our attendance and you know and what is particularly our in New York because we have such a big tourism market what's our local attendance so I almost think that people have to museums have to ask the question a different way um, and then find you know how are they creating that shared cultural experience in different settings yes okay Frank go ahead please um, I hate to put a little kibosh and I'll, as wonderful as this sounds but one of the issues we face in Hartford and uh, particularly is that a lot of the population in Connecticut um, is worried about coming to Hartford and it's crime, it's homeless people, they're afraid they know somebody who got mugged 25 years ago mm -hmm. and so forth. And what you have is a barrier, those folks, that even though it's two dollars, it keeps a certain part of the population out of off your island. And of course we don't have that luxury here in Iquil because we're open to all the streets it's a public park and so forth. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think as someone, I, I used to live in Seattle and uh, for a long, I mean, I grew up in New York, I lived in Seattle. I think the problem, in New York we have tons of homeless people, but we have tons of other people. And so really you never hear anyone in New York saying, I'm not gonna go to a place because there's homeless people, because there's just so many other people. Um, I was in Boulder recently, which has actually sort of a similar situation, and that was in Boulder of all places, right? <laughs> We have homeless people and we can't, you know, how can we use the park? It's like, how do you make it a place that everybody wants to go? And, you know, you are correct that we tend not to have a visible homeless population on Governor's Island. Um, but I think it's really how do you make a place vital? Because once there are people, people want to be in places where there are other people. Um, and that's true in libraries, that's true in public parks, that's true in, you know, bus stations, wherever it is. So we don't hear that question in parks in New York. Um, really, I hear that question in other cities where you have that legacy, right, where people didn't have to be in the park downtown because they live in the suburbs and they have backyards, and so that's still a barrier. But I think it's when once people are downtown and there's something vital going on downtown that is different than what they can get in their smaller community or in their backyard, um, then you begin to answer that question sort of naturally. I think we had one more. Yes. Public financing of 
Sure. So I'll clarify a little bit. So the island is an economic development project. We have all these buildings. It, it is not a park. It has public space. Um, and, and in fact, the deed required that we create some new public space. I definitely advanced the strategy and convinced the people I work for, who at the time were actually both the mayor and the governor, that we should start with public space. Um, and the initial resistance was, well, we have actually 33 acres set aside for new construction. Well, what happens if the developers come in and they want to change the park? And I said, just tough. <laughs> you know, we're going to do that first and create this transformation. Um, and we, I don't, I, there wasn't, I mean, there, it took us a while to get funding for it. You know, we sort of got a little bits of funding, then we got bigger bits of funding. But really what we did, to be perfectly honest, and it was a very, I won't go into this, but it was a very complicated political situation because I worked for both the city and the state. So it was, um, what, the city give money? Yeah, originally it was the city and state, and then now this is a city. Now it is a city project. What we really did was, to be perfectly honest, we made it a popular place. So if we had waited for permission from elected officials, you would not be inviting me here, right? Because yeah. yeah, yeah. but, but in Hartford, we're even finding difficulty to get people, regular people, to want to spend government's money on something but, that could be. But what I'm saying is, we didn't ask them to spend money first. We we basically took the as is island, opened up a bunch of crap, opened it up and created experiences. We off, you know, we had bikes when nobody had bikes. We had free culture when nobody had culture. We made the boat free. So people were already using and loving it at the time when the, f the funding came after that. So we started doing things and making it a place that people wanted to be. Um, the place where we did have money, like with iQuilt, right, was we did do a master plan for the park and public space, which we started, but we involved the public in that. They had equity in that plan. But most importantly, and you could see from our visitation numbers, you know, we were getting a quarter of a million people in a place, you know, for 40 days of the you know, year before any of the money flowed. And if we had waited and started the conversation about, like, do you want to, we couldn't have done a bond issue, for example, that just legally we wouldn't have been able to do we wouldn't be here today. So it became a place that people became excited about. They became excited about the ideas, but they became excited about the experience. And I'll just be really honest with you who, you know, elected officials respond to their constituents. And so it started to become a place that people were excited about um, because they had been there. Some of the elected officials had been there themselves with their families. And they were like, this is a place that really can add something to our city. So. If that, I hope that answers your question. Well, on that great note, I hope you'll join me in thanking Leslie for a really stimulating <laughs> I really want to thank Doug and uh, Leslie for our time tonight and, and yours as well. Um, just a couple of quick things, so a little parting treat as you go out, so make sure you grab one. Um, and as you see from the scrolling screen, we have a lot of um, exciting things coming up. Doug's going to be at the Hartford Public Library tomorrow night talking about um, some historical stuff in Hartford and, and where it is today. If those of you who haven't seen the Bushnell Plaza Sculpture Garden yet, um, I really highly recommend that you go take a walk up there. It's um, incredible and wonderful. And hats off to the Bushnell Plaza Association and also Joan Hurwitz, who really helped us um, create that up there. In addition to that, we have Winterfest starting in another couple of weeks. Um, we hope that you all come down. We started the day after Thanksgiving and it'll run until February 1st. It's a great time. We anticipate over 60,000 skaters, over 110,000 visitors to Winterfest this year. So we're hoping you'll come down and enjoy it. And uh, if you want to give a little bit of money to it, we've started a CrowdWise account to, um, to help us out fund it a little bit this year. So um, we really hope that you've enjoyed this evening. Love any of your feedback. We're hoping to bring some of these conversations once or twice a year. Um, and again, I'd really like to thank Doug and Leslie for so much for tonight. <laughs>